know he's worthy? How many know the Lord is worthy? This simple song, sing along with me. Lord, you are worthy. Lord, worthy. And we give you. And we give you the praise. Lord, you are to the Lomax Temple Amy Zion Church. We're glad that you took time to tune in to our online worship service today to worship the Lord together. I just want to say that 1 Corinthians says this in 12, 12. It says the Apostle Paul simply says this, just as the body is one and has many members and all the members of the body, though many are one body, we're all in Christ. And because we are one body, when one of us hurt, you know, all of us hurt. And some of our families have lost loved ones this recently. And I just want to lift up those families. I want to lift up the Lawson family, the, the Kennedy family, the, the, the Purifor family, and also the Edwards family, who is Joy Edwards in Flint, which is a great friend of mine. And we just lift them up right now in prayer. And while we are not physically together, I just want to praise God that we can come together through this means of worship. We're still running this race of life together in unison towards the same finish line. And we really miss seeing everyone's faces. So please stay tuned at the end of this um, sermon where you'll get a chance to see some testimonies as we continue to seek God to heal our land. As believers, we trust God truly as who is working things out for our good. A time is coming and has now come where the true worship is to worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kinds of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship him in spirit and in truth. So let us come together and let us worship God together at this time.
Good morning, Lomax. This morning's scripture will be taken from Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 34. I'll be reading out of the NIV. Amen. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food? and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds in the air. They do not sow or reap or store in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are ye not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that's how God, if that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you you have little faith. So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Lomax, that's our scripture for this morning. God bless you. Amen. We're so glad that you got a chance to make it back. We're going to be looking and beginning really at the word of God. And we're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 6. And I want to look just at verse 25. See, so it's Matthew chapter 6, looking at verse number 25. And this is Jesus speaking to his disciples. And he just simply says this, he says, therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what to eat or drink or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and body more than clothes? I just want us to look at the word therefore. As we look at this word Therefore, we is is setting us up to let us know that there was something said prior to getting to this point. Therefore, so Jesus is telling them. Therefore, since I have explained all this to you, then you just need to do these particular things. I want you to know that when I look back at some things that I've been challenged with this week with regards on going to two funerals and hearing of a friend's death, God is still reminding me that therefore he still yet sits on a throne. You need to get this and understand that when we experience different challenges in our lives, sometimes it's just a small distraction, even though it's going on in the world all at the same time. See, at many times I find myself riding from Grand Rapids to Detroit and on my way to Grand Rapids and going back to Detroit, going back and forth. But if I leave early in the morning, every now and then I, I run into some fog in Lansing. And you need to understand that when you run through fog, you can't see too far because all you're able to see is just the fog that's in the way at this current time. But 
at times when we look at life, we have to begin to realize while I'm driving through the fog, I have to depend on what I used to do, how I was taught, how I need to be driving. I have to look back on how I've been trained from driver's ed to experiencing. So therefore, I have to reflect on what I've already known to manage and to make it through this fog. You need to understand that worries, that concerns, that fears are sometimes a foggy situation. And we have to realize and depend that we have to look back on what God has said to us in our lives. So therefore, we have to look back to what the word of God is. Is saying when we look at fog in our lives, when we look at the things that cause us distraction in our lives, Earl Nightingale say said it this way. He wrote an article as it relates to worry. He said that 40% of our worries is dealing with something that will never happen. Then he said another 30% of our worries is dealing with something that happened in the past. And then he say 12% of our worries is dealing with something as it relates to our health. And then he say 10% of our worries is something that's petty and really doesn't matter. Matter of fact, it's only about 8% of the things that we're concerned about that might cause us to have true concern. But when we look at all this and what it adds up to be. It's merely fog that's in our lives because God is telling us he has everything yet still under control. When you look at what's taking place, when you look at the 8% of the worries that we have and says that maybe those are the only things that we need to be concerned with and 98% of the things are the things that really is just fog and causing distraction and just getting in our way. But God is saying, I have you covered. And if you look at fog itself and, and about seven blocks of fog, you can put seven blocks of fog in a 10-ounce glass. See, fog is just merely a distraction. And Jesus is just telling them, since this is going on in your life, therefore you need not to worry because it's just merely a foggy situation. And God gives them, we see Jesus giving them instructions on what they need to do in order to not worry. See, when we look at our lives, God has always given us instructions to why we should not worry. When we look at it, it's merely just fall. Therefore, don't worry because God has given us instruction. Jesus gives them instructions about how they ought to live and some things they ought to do as it relates to chapter 6. When we look at chapter 6, we begin looking at verses 1 and 2 of, of chapter 6, and we see Jesus telling them, just don't practice righteousness just to be seen, but live it because that should be your lifestyle. When we look at verses 3 and 4, Jesus tells them, guess what? Anytime you're giving to people who are in need, don't sit there and try to tell everybody about what you've done for somebody else that you might get a reward from them. God says that I see you in the private and I will reward you so you don't have to worry about it. Jesus is telling them, just live righteous, act righteous. Everything you ought to do, you ought to do it with integrity. Matter of fact, when you give to people, you're not giving it so somebody put your name on a banner, but you're giving it because that the, you see God's people in need. And when you get to verses 4 through 15, Jesus is telling them, guess what? He told them about how to live. He told them about how to give, and then he tells them how to pray. He says, guess what? When you, when you pray, that first thing you need to be praying is sincere, sincere prayers. 
You need to have a sincere prayer about what you're doing. You're not just praying for just some words to say that you may hope that they fall on the Father's ear, or you're praying in such a way that you're trying to actually um, show yourself that you know all these big and fancy words, but you're praying that your words may be sincere to the Father. Jesus tells them, you have to pray in this manner, in this way. He tells them, you have to begin with our Father who is holy. You need to understand when you're talking to God, you're talking to somebody who's holy, who's set apart. He sits high and he's worthy of your praise. Not only is he holy, but your prayer ought to be a prayer of thanksgiving for all that he's done for you, all the doors he's opened for you. You're thanking him for the food that he's providing, for the house that he's given down to you. You're asking him just so praise his holy name for what he's doing in your life. And then he says, also, when you get get through this prayer, you need to ask for forgiveness because you have fallen short of the glory of God. You need to ask for forgiveness. So he's telling them that they need to pray and ask for forgiveness, but not just to forgive from their sake, but they also ought to forgive others for what they have done to them. And then he says, your prayer also need to include, guess what? Help me and not to falling into my own issues in my life. Because every last one of us have our own issues. Every last one of us is dealing with something that causes us to fall and fall short of the glory of God. He's saying that you need to be praying to me to give you help. Now unto him who's able to keep you from stumbling or falling, you're asking God to help you in the midst of your situation. So he tells them how to pray. And then verses 16 through 18, Jesus just tells them, guess what, when you're fasting, and you ought to fast. You're not doing it in a way that everybody knows that you're fasting. He says, matter of fact, straighten up. Clean your face. Make sure you're not looking so miserable about this fast because you're doing it that you may get closer to God. So he tells them how they ought to live. He tells them how they ought to pray. They, he tells them how they ought to be concerned about others. And then he tells them, don't be a lover of money. Don't get caught up in loving money and, and, and things. He says, you, 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 when you love one, you will hate the other. When you love money so much, you will despise God. When you love money so much, you will despise giving to God. He, he's trying to tell them, guess what? If you love God, that's what you need to be seeking. He says, seek first and the kingdom of all is righteousness, and everything else will be added. He's trying to get to the point to understand that God, if you seek God, God will bless you with everything that you are needing. Proverbs 18 and 16 says it this way, a man gifts makes room for him and brings him before great men. See, Jesus was instructing them just to do what you needed to do. He had take care of everything that you needed. So therefore, there's no need for you to worry. Therefore, there's no need for you to be concerned because I'm telling you, God is saying, I got your back. There is no need for you to worry when you're living a lifestyle, giving yourself to God. And then Jesus gives instructions. Jesus gives also, he, he gives them instructions. He gives them information. Now he, he gives them instructions on how they ought to live. Therefore, don't worry because God has given us instructions. You need to understand this, that when our order was given by the governor about staying at home, God is saying, guess what? I've ordained her as governor. I have ordained him as president. Understand that when we set that up, we have to follow what the law is saying. When it does not violate God's word, then we have to follow what the, what the government is asking us and the law is of the land. I'm never going to ever say that because we are trusting in God, because we're leaning not to our own understanding, that we should disobey the law of the land. We need to understand that we cannot just simply say we're going to walk around with no mask or no gloves and no this and just ringing around when God is saying, I have set them over you. So you understand, we can't discount or ignore what these safeguards are. 
See, anytime God is asking us and putting people in place, he's also giving and, and leading them. As long as it doesn't go against God's word, we have to follow what the law is saying. And I want you to be safe out there. Making sure you're wearing masks and gloves and when you go to the pump wearing gloves to, to, to fill your tank and throwing them away appropriately. But Jesus is also saying, do not worry. He says, therefore, even in the midst of the challenge that we are experiencing, Jesus is still informing us, therefore, I tell you, do not worry. Even in the midst of what's happening, therefore, do not worry. Point two is, therefore, don't worry because God has given us information. See, when we look at verse 25, it says, therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what to eat, what to drink, about your body, what you will wear. If is not life more than food and the body more than clothes. See, don't worry about life. Don't worry about your day. Don't worry about your food. Don't worry about your closing. He says, isn't life more than life? Isn't life more than those things? Because those are just things in, in our lives. God is saying, isn't life more than just these things? And I understand that many of us are facing issues as it relates to job or our house or our stuff, but Jesus is still informing us, therefore, do not worry. Paul writes about this in the Bible when no matter what it is that he's experienced and no matter what it is he's going through, he, even though he goes through some ups and some downs, Paul is telling us in Philippians 4, he says, I know what is, uh, it is to be in need and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any situation whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or living in want. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And some of us have been living life with little, but we have been blessed to have and much. See, some of us can look back in our lives and remember how poor we were, but then we see how God has blessed us and brought us out. Some of us can look back and realize that we didn't have a lot of food, but God now has our refrigerator full. Some of us can look back on when we used to drive a hoopty and our car would get us sometimes to where we wanted to go, but at times wouldn't bring us back home. But now we have new cars cars in our driveways. See, some of us is dealing with unemployment or have dealt with unemployment or dealt with lack, but God has brought us through and kept us and made us and made some money that came in our account and continued to bless us in a mighty way. Some of us right now is dealing with pay cuts, but God is still providing for us. And so we thank him for what he's doing in our lives. Paul is so confident as it relates to what God is doing. He said, maybe there was a time when I had little. Maybe there was a time when I had lack. But I'm knowing that one thing I do know, all things I can do, I can do through Christ who strengthens me. See, the psalm writer writes this this way. He says, I, when I was young and now I'm old, and yet I have never seen the righteous forsaken or a seed begging for bread. You need to understand that Jesus is saying, therefore I tell you, do not worry about anything that comes up in your life because I have you covered. So do not worry about anything. Jesus is providing them with, with information. He says, therefore, don't worry because God gives us information. Therefore, don't worry because God gives us instructions. God has given us everything that we, we need. See, see, we have to understand that even now, and I know there are some who are, are so fearful of what's to come, but God didn't give us the spirit of fear. He really didn't give us the spirit of fear, but he gave us a power and love and a sound mind. And even though we're walking through taking precautions, we're not 
afraid of what's happening. Because when I put my faith in him who's able to keep me and keep me from stumbling, who's able to save me and protect me, who's able to heal and redeem, he's that one who saves all these things. So when he says, therefore, I don't have to worry because he's been telling me about all the things he's been doing in my life. So therefore, I don't have to worry about my life. I don't have to worry about what I'm going to eat. I don't have to worry about what I'm going to drink. I don't have to worry about life itself because he has my back. So he's explaining to me. He gives me information. He gives me instructions. And so therefore, I don't have to worry. And point three is therefore, don't worry because the Lord gives us an illustration. He gives us an illustration, an illustration to what's going on. Because every now and then, many of us don't get the in instructions that's been given to us. Many of us don't hold to the information that's been given to us. But God also provides us with an illustration. When we look at verse 26, when we look at verses 26 through 31, we see Jesus giving an illustration to his people. Jesus gives an illustration to his people. Verse 26, it says, look at the birds in the air. They don't sow or reap or store away barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. And are you so much more valuable than they are? See, you need to understand that, that, that when you look at Matthew 10 and 29, Jesus says this over there. He says, are not sparrows sold for two pennies? And yet not one of them have fallen to the ground outside because your father cares. And even the very hairs of your head are numbered. So don't be afraid for you're worth more than sparrows. So he says, don't worry. Don't you see the, the birds in the air? And he's saying, I take care of them. Jesus is reminding us when you look at the word of God, the word of God constantly reminds us how valuable we are to him. You are valuable to God, even in the midst of what we see. God still you're still valuable to him. When you look at Psalms 8 and 5, it says you are made a little lower than angels. But a lot of times you need to look and see a little footnote at the bottom of that. It says you're a little valuable than Elohim, which means that God is saying you are, I made you a little lower than myself. See, you are set apart. You're set aside because God loves you. You are important to God. Isaiah 43 says it this way, and beginning with verse 2, it says, when you pass through the waters, God is saying, I'll be there. He says, when it goes, and when the rivers, and when you pass through the rivers, they would not sweep you over. When you walk through the fire, you would not be burned. The flames would not set you ablaze. For it says, for I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. So you are important to the Father. You are important to the Son. You are important to the Holy Spirit. You are important to, the, to God, the Godhead himself. See, God understands your situation, and he loves you in the midst of all that we are experiencing, and he's right there with us. See, the Word of God reminds us that God has a great love for us, and he lavishes that on us. God is telling us that he loves us more than we can think or can ever imagine. 
So therefore, there's no need to worry because God gives us this illustration of what's going on. And then it moves on to verse 27. It says, can anyone add one hour of your life? By just worrying. See, you need to get this and begin to understand that when we begin to worry and be concerned about everything, we're not adding to our lives. Matter of fact, we're taking away from our lives because worry leads to hypertension. Worry leads to us um, doing things that we shouldn't be doing. Worry ends up causing us to lose more of our lives than actually gaining more of our lives. God is saying, therefore, do not worry worry about your clothes. Don't worry about uh, what you're going to wear. He says, look at the flowers and how they grow and how they're made. He's saying, and, and, and they did not labor or spin. And yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. In verse 30, he says that if that is how God clothed the grass of the fields, which are here today, and gone tomorrow, and thrown in the fire. Will he not much more clothe you, O oh, little faith? So don't worry, what shall you eat? Don't worry, what shall you drink? For understanding that God has our back. He's the one who's taking care of everything that we're dealing with. God gives us this illustration that we may know that he's right there with us. He's right there providing for us. I know some of us have gotten out of some situation because God has brought us out of some tough situations. Some of us have dealt with abusive relationship, but God has rescued us from those situations. Some of us have dealt with, I do not have a job and wondering where my provisions is going to come from, but God has made provisions for you out of nowhere. Some of us have felt as though we're losing our mind. We can't figure out where to go if we're coming or if we're going. But God has kept our mind. He's kept us in our right state of mind. Even though we thought we was about to lose it all, ain't it good to know that when we look back on what he's done and how he's doing it, we can thank God for what he's doing. So therefore, we don't have to worry. Therefore, we don't have to worry about what to eat. Therefore, we don't have to worry about what we can decide with. Therefore, we don't have to worry about the virus because God has our back. Say, therefore, don't worry because God, our Lord, loves us. He gives us these illustrations. Therefore, we don't have to worry because he gives us these instructions. Therefore, we don't have to worry because he gives us all this information. Therefore, we don't have to worry because he gives us all these illustrations. Therefore, we don't have to worry. Then God also invites us to be with him. When we look at verse 33, it says, but seek first the kingdom of and his righteous, righteousness, and all these things will be added. Say, therefore, don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has its own troubles. See, the Lord invites us to seek him. See, we, he's saying, therefore, don't, don't worry about what's going on. He says, just, just seek me. This, just, therefore, don't worry about the concerns. Just, just seek me. Therefore, don't worry about what the news is saying. Just, just seek me. Therefore, if you look back at your life and what I brought you, you, you should have a track record of seeing how I kept you, how I blessed you, how I, how I, I made ways, I opened doors for you. He's saying, therefore, when you look back at all those things, you'll realize that if you have made it through what you have made it through, if you have gotten to this point, this day, this second, you don't have to worry because God is saying, I pulled you out. I kept you in the midst of that situation. Therefore, you do not have to worry. I know some may say you really don't understand what it is that I'm experiencing. You really don't know what's going on in my life. Yes, I can say I really don't know what you experience, but yet you can say I don't. you don't know what I'm experiencing. I had to deal with two funerals this week. I had to deal with some people being sick. Understanding that when I look back at 
at my life, when you look back at your life, the thing that we can only do is sympathize with one another. That means I can have compassion on the situation that you're going through. I can empathize with you. That means I can attempt to share in your feelings. I can attempt to share in your pain. But there's one who understands you. There's one who knows what you're going through. There's one who can see your very situation. And he simply says, therefore, don't worry. Therefore, don't worry about what's going on because I'm right here with you. I'm providing for you. I'm protecting you. I'm covering you. I'm loving on you. I'm just right there. So therefore, don't be worried or concerned anymore. See, see, I have a grandson that's, that's, that's about four and he, you know, at four, you really don't have any concerns in, in the world. And, and, and you're really not afraid of a lot of different things. And every now and then when um, he would run and just jump and expect me to catch him every time. And then he would say, okay, granddad, can you throw me in the air? And he, I throw him in the air as high as I can throw him and catch him. And when he came down, he busts out laughing every time. Once again, he say, do it again. I take him and I throw him as high as as I can. And when I catch him, he begins to bust in laughter one more time. I remember standing somewhere and one lady came up to me. She said, you know what? That's making me a little nervous and I can't understand why he's not nervous. I simply say to her, because when he looked at his track record, when he looked at what his grandfather had done, he realized that I never ever dropped him, not one time. So every time he goes in the air, he's in the air and can risk being harmed, but he knew his grandfather would catch him every time. And I'm here just to tell you that you don't have to worry, don't have to be concerned, because we serve a God who will never leave or forsake or drop us. If we realize the God that we serve, we don't have to worry, don't have to be concerned. We don't have to worry about the virus. We don't have to worry about what's saying on TV because he's never, ever going to drop us. Every time it feels like we're floating in the air and about to come down and hit the ground, our Father will always catch us every single time. He'll pick us up. He makes us, turns us all around, understanding that God is right there with you. So there's no need to worry. And he reminds us that if we come to him now, if we come to him at this time, he says that he gives us peace that surpasses all understanding. God is good unto us. God has been good to us. And even right now, he's still yet is good. He still yet is a great God. And he's reminding us, therefore, don't worry. I know what the news says. Therefore, don't worry. I know what your neighbor says. Therefore, don't worry. I know what's going on in this world, but God is still saying, therefore, don't worry. See, this is your opportunity to give your life to Christ. See, we got to be like um, in the one in Luke in 18. There was this, this beggar who, who heard that Jesus was on his way. And he began to shout out, Father, Son of David, don't pass me by. See, when we get to a point of crying out to God and saying, don't pass me by. See, the thing about it is some folks tried to keep him quiet. Some folks tried to shut him up. Some folks say, you know, it don't take all that. But when you get to a point of saying, no matter what you're experiencing, no matter what's going on, or maybe you still have that worry and that doubt in your head, and this is your opportunity that you can call out to God and say, don't pass me by, for I need a Savior right now. And he's one who's able to save even right now. We have to be like that beggar and say, Lord, it's me, it's me, standing in the need of prayer. Oh, it's me, don't pass me by, oh, gentle Savior, for I need you right now. We have to be the one crying out to say, I need thee, I need thee, oh, Lord. This is your opportunity. 
to give your life to Christ. Don't let this moment pass you by. Here's the thing. He takes care of our worries. Jesus says, come to me all who are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Come to me who all who's burdened. Come to me all who's stressed out. Come to me all who's feeling however they're feeling. And Jesus is saying, I will give you rest. I will give you peace. I will give you comfort. But you must come. If you don't know Christ for the pardoning of your sin, that means that if you know all the stuff that you've done wrong, everything that you've done wrong, Jesus is saying, guess what? I will forgive you of everything that you have done. He taught him in the Lord's prayer. He says, forgive me for the debts that I've done. Forgive me for all the wrong that I've done. See, that's part of the prayer when we talked about it earlier, is asking God to forgive you. We're thanking him. We come to him holy and realizing that we ought to be reverence. For he is a great God, a great king above all kings. He's the only one who can save not being good enough, not giving enough, but he wants your heart that you can give to him. This is your opportunity. All you need to do is just raise your hand right now and say, Lord, I give my life to you. Oh, God, I ask that you come, rest, rule, and abide within me. Begin to change me. Forgive me for everything that I have done. And it says, and I believe that you died and arose for my sins. And when we do that, saves, it says the word says that you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that he is the son of God, that he died and rose for our sin. It says that you shall be saved. He says that I will give you life and that more abundantly. I, I will give you eternal life. God desires to bless us in a mighty way, but we want to also give our lives to him. This is your opportunity because of all what he's done. Therefore, don't worry. Therefore, don't be concerned. Therefore, give your life to him. The word of God for the people of God, thanks be to God. We have come to an awesome part of the service now in which you all can participate in. As we recognize God as the owner of everything that we have, I want to express my appreciation for all of those who are faithful in their giving of their tithes and their offering. Um, as we look at this virus has hit Detroit and we, as we continue to talk about that, it's hard on our city of Detroit. And we want to continue to do the work of ministry by blessing God's people within our community. And we need your help and your assistance. I want to thank you again for so much, and I just appreciate all your prayers and all your financial giving, and we just ask that you continue to do what you're doing as we're doing the work of ministry with blessing our people. You can give right now through Zelle or Givelify, PayPal, and of course you can always mail your checks in to 17441 to Quinter Street, Detroit, Michigan. 48212. And please, if you have any questions, please contact our church, and the number is right down below. We thank you again for joining us this week for our online service. Join us every Wednesday for our intercessory prayer that begins at 6 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Also, Bible study is on Wednesday, both at noon and 6 p.m. To access our online Bible study, simply go to our website, Lomax www.lomaxtemple.org and click on the Bible study link at the bottom of the page. Finally, we invite you to like our Facebook page and to subscribe to our YouTube channel. And following this, we have a testimony from one of our Lomax members who God has truly blessed. Hello, Lomax. I want to say thank you for the prayers. I thank everyone for the well wishes, the concern. As you can see, for those who don't know, I survived, and I'm healthy, well, and glad that I'm alive. Thank God. Thank you, everybody. I just want to give the benediction to you all. And may the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, guide your heart and your 